Hey, good morning and welcome to another daily devotional. Thank you for joining with me today. I hope you're getting something out of these. I, I hope that these have been helpful and enjoyable to you. Um, I'm certainly enjoying being able to record them every day and dig into God's word with you. I think it's been helpful, uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing on this practice for quite some time. Uh, it was even thinking today about going beyond Matthew, maybe next into the book of Acts, and then I want to talk about Revelation. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think that those are appropriate uh, books for our day, and uh, looking forward to getting into those. But today, we're continuing in our series in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have a Bible with you today, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40 as we get into this. Now, let me remind you of the context. Jesus had been doing several miracles, uh, multiple kinds of healings, casting out of demons. And the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders of the day said, the only reason you're doing this or the only way you can do this, Jesus, is because obviously you're from Satan. You are working for him, and you're in league with the devil, and uh, that's how you have the power to do this. Um, Jesus' response, well, these are my words of what Jesus was saying, is that you th that's idiotic. You guys are, are that's a, the most absurd and stupid statement I have ever heard. Why would one kingdom war against itself? That wouldn't do any good. Obviously, I'm not from Satan. Uh, I am a stronger man. I am I am greater than he is because Jesus was fully God. Um, and so that was the context of what was going on. The scribes and the Pharisees were not content with this. And so now they are going to ask him for another sign. So today we're going to see three things that uh, Jesus is going to give the most important sign. Uh, then we're going to see the consequences of rejecting Jesus and then the true family of Jesus. So let's dig into God's word today. <clears throat> the most important sign that Jesus is going to give, we're going to find this in Matthew chapter 12 as we dig in, starting in verse 38. Here's what it says. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, the word sign is the word that just means the, the, the mark, the token, the sign. It is some miracle or some wonder that authenticates the person who was sent by God. Now, in the in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we have multiple signs that are happening. We have multiple wonders and miracles that are happening because it is authentic, uh, authenticating the start and the beginning of the church. Jesus is doing incredible signs and miracles and wonders because he is um, being authenticated by God the Father. That's why Jesus is doing all of these things. He is proving himself to be God in the flesh, God incarnate. And they say to him, <clears throat> say to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, they had no reason to ask this because Jesus had done many, many signs, many miracles, many wonders of which they have already seen. But they were looking for another way or another reason or opportunity to reject Jesus. If Jesus did provide a sign for them, they would just find a way to speak against it. And they would also uh, find a way to accuse him and say, you are just doing this because you're of Satan. Um, if he didn't do a sign for them, they could then say, see, you're not really of God. You're not even doing a sign. So Jesus is going to respond to them and say to them, you're an evil and adulterous generation. That, that's his first comment. You're an evil and adulterous generation. So Jesus is really calling them out for their hard-heartedness and their wickedness. The word evil is the word in the Greek language, it's uh, ponaro, which means uh, somebody in a, in a physical sense, it means to be diseased. In an ethical sense, it means to be evil, wicked, or bad. So what Jesus is saying is you're, you're a bad character. You are, you're malignant. You are like a tumor. You're a tumor that has devoured and it's, it's killing everything and everyone else around it. That's the word evil. You're an evil and you're an adulterous generation. Now the word adulterous in the Greek language is the, uh, the Greek word uh, moikalos and moikalos means um, an adulteress. It is, it, God always referred to Israel in the Old Testament uh, with a certain metaphor that Jesus is going to pick up again in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the metaphor was that God was um, God was the husband and Israel was his bride. And he would often liken the relationship with Israel like a marriage relationship. And so every time they would 
they would walk away from God, it would be, um, they, they were essentially committing adultery against God. And he would use terms like, um, like them playing the harlot, um, like them going into idolatry as, as committing adultery. He would call them unclean. They would be talked about as apostate. Um, it was a breach of a relationship with God. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about the church as that kind of relationship, that he is the bridegroom and that we are the bride, the bride of Christ. Um, Israel was replaced by the church as the true bride of Christ. It doesn't mean that we are replacing Israel, that Israel has no longer any impact or any effect. Israel is incredibly important. Um, Israel is where our Savior came out of. Uh, Israel is, is what all of the Bible relates to. Um, Israel has not been replaced. Israel has an opportunity to be a part of the church. They are the root of the church. All of the church came out of Israel, but Israel has rejected Jesus. They are, they are adulterers to Jesus. They are harlots, and Jesus calls them out. He says, you're an evil and adulterous generation. You have walked away from God. You're playing the harlot. Now, Israel has the opportunity to come to Jesus to be accepted as his bride once again, but they have rejected him. And so this is an example. This had to break God's heart, by the way. It's the same way that it would break the heart of a, of a man or a woman whose spouse is an adulterer or an adulteress. Um, if they have committed adultery in some manner, it hurts the spouse that was being faithful. Um, it breaks the relationship. The relationship is broken at that point. That's why Jesus says, this is the only reason I'm giving you to get a divorce is because of, uh, uh, of adultery, because you've broken the relationship. But restoration is always possible with God and between people. With God, if you have walked away from him, you have played the harlot, you have committed adultery against God because you've chased after some other thing, you have the opportunity to come back to him. It's called repentance. Repentance is turning away from the direction I was going, turning away from the wickedness and the sin that I was participating in and coming back to God and saying, would you please forgive me? I am sorry. I, I want to be different. I want to follow you. I want to commit my life to you. It's called a recommitment to him. In the same way, it works in marriage. Just because there has been adultery in marriage doesn't mean that the marriage is over. There's an opportunity that can happen of restoration where the spouse who was unfaithful comes back and says, I am sorry. I was wrong. I was stupid. Please forgive me. Can we work on this? I will recommit to you. I am, will never do this again. And there's an opportunity there for restoration. So Jesus is calling him out and he's saying, you're an evil and adulterous generation. You don't have to stay that way. If you will return to me, if you will repent, if you will ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you and we will be restored. But if you don't ask for repentance, if you don't seek repentance and ask for forgiveness, then we are broken in our, in our fellowship. We are broken in our, in our relationship. So they were not asking him a sign in order to, because they were really curious and really wanted anything. They were already hard hearted and walked away from God. And so Jesus calls them out and then he gives the most important sign that he can give. He says that no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, you remember who Jonah was. Jonah was in the Old Testament. Jonah was called by God to go preach to the Ninevites. The Ninevites were wicked. They were depraved. They were idolatrous. They were pagan. Jonah did not want to go. He did not want any hope for Nineveh or the Ninevites. He did not want to go. And in the process of him refusing and rebelling to go, Jonah was swallowed up by a whale. And he was spent three days, three nights in the belly of the whale, was spit out onto the shore of Nineveh, and he went and he preached and the people repented. So Jesus says, no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here's what Jesus is doing. He's prophesying about what's going to happen and what is going to come. 
what's going to happen we know the end of the story they would not have known it at that time but the end of the story was that jesus would be hung on the cross he would die he would be buried in a tomb three days later he would rise again it was an example of what jonah did jonah was a type of christ in the old testament jonah was he, jonah went to a wicked people jonah called the people to repentance and Jonah spent those three days and three nights in the belly of the beast in the same way that Jesus spends the three days in the tomb. Jesus came to a wicked generation. He called the people to repentance. Now, the only difference was in Jonah's day, they actually repented. In Jesus's day, they crucified him. Let's look at the rest of the story. The men of Nineveh, Jesus says, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonah. And indeed a, greater, uh, indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. So what is Jesus saying? In Jonah's day, when the people were preached to and they heard repentance, they actually repented. But now somebody is here who's greater than Jonah, Jesus. And Jesus preached repentance, but the people did not repent. When the end comes, the Ninevites will condemn this generation because they heard the message and repented you've had somebody greater than jonah in your midst and i preached and you wouldn't repent therefore the people of nineveh will judge you and condemn you someday and then he says and indeed a greater than jonah is here i am far greater than jonah and i was right here and you did not repent and then he says the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus has just said, I'm greater than Jonah, and I'm greater than Solomon. Two people that they would have looked to in their religious system and in their religious studies as, as people to be held in esteem. And Jesus is just saying, I'm greater than both of those. Jonah went to Nineveh. He preached. They repented. They're going to condemn you and judge you because you did not. Then he talks about the queen of the south. The queen of the south was wicked, depraved, idolatrous, a pagan, and this queen repented. And she will judge you because you heard the message, she repented, and you didn't. So who was this queen of the south? Well, quickly, let's, let's talk about that. The queen of the south is also known as the queen of Sheba. Uh, you may remember that story from First, Cre First Kings chapter 10 or Second Chronicles chapter 9. And she was a queen uh, somewhere probably around Ethiopia is what they what they um, suspect. Um, she heard about Solomon's fame. And so she came uh, to see him. She wanted to see him. So she brought with her a large quantity of spices and gold and precious stones and attendants and camels. And she was drawn to, Jer in, to Jerusalem because of Solomon's fame. She came because she wanted to test him with some very hard questions. And Solomon was able to answer all of them. She was so impressed with Solomon's wisdom and the and what the riches of, of his kingdom that she proclaimed to him in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 7, she said, your wisdom and prosperity far surpass the report that I had heard. This queen of the south heard the message, repented, and now she will be in judgment over the nation that Jesus is with because they didn't repent. What is he calling people to? He's calling people to repentance. And he's saying, here's the sign that I really am God. I will go into the tomb and I will rise again three days the same way that Jonah did. He preached and they repented. The queen of the south heard and she repented. And you guys won't repent. Well, there's consequences to not repenting. And here's the consequences of rejecting Jesus. Here's what Jesus goes on to say. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. Now, most people use these texts, the one that I just read, as the basis of all spiritual warfare. 
The problem is that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not at all talking about spiritual warfare. He's not talking about demonic possession. He uses this example, but he is not talking about people being demonically possessed. It can relate. A lot of things in scripture are, are dual purposed and they have dual meanings. But think of the context of what Jesus is just talking about. He is talking to people who he calls an adulterous and wicked and evil generation. Jesus preached, they did not repent. They were hard-hearted and they, they did not repent and they will get far worse. Now, this is a reference to what Jesus just says to the entire nation of Israel. Jesus came into Israel and he did a cleansing work. He did a work of healing, casting out demons, preaching and teaching. He would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would cast out demons. He would heal the sick, the blind, the lame. He would, he would take care of the people who were broken and hurting. He came to clean the nation of Israel. He came to bring them to a point of repentance. After Jesus died on the cross, after he rose again, he was seen for days among many different people. And then he ascended into eternity. He ascended into heaven. After he ascended, which would be somewhere around 33, perhaps AD, from that point on, the nation of Israel got more and more wicked, harder hearted, until AD 70, where the Romans came in and completely wiped out and destroyed Israel, wiped them off the map so that they were no longer Israel. Now they would be known as Palestine until they were reborn in 1948. So for all, almost 2000 years, the nation of Israel did not exist. Jesus's point is this. I came in and cleaned. I came in and preached a message of repentance. You did not respond. When I left, you did not fill me or fill the land of Israel with my spirit. Instead, you continued to be wicked. And when that happened, when Jesus left and the spirit of God was not there, the demons who were there came back. But this time they brought, they brought seven others more wicked than themselves. And the last state of Israel is far worse than the first. Jesus is not saying that this is what happens demonically, demon possession, although it can. It can happen like that. If you let God clean your heart and you don't fill your heart with him, then you can open that house back up, your heart being your house. You can open it back up to uh, demonic influence. And it could be worse for you. You could be harder hearted now than you were ever at the beginning because you did not fill that up with God. But he is talking about the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel who did not fill up the emptiness with God, instead have just invited evil to come back. That's what Jesus is referring to. And that's the consequences of rejecting him. When you reject Jesus, you are opening yourself up for the influence of wickedness to come back. Well, one final thought on uh, today's Bible reading. And the final thought is this, the true family of Jesus. So here's how it all ends in chapter 12. While Jesus was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. Now, let's just stop there for just a second. This is an indication that Jesus indeed had siblings. There's teachings in the Catholic Church that says that Mary was a perpetual virgin. She was a virgin at birth, and she never had any physical relations with a man from that point on. That's just not true. It's, it's reading something in that is absolutely not there. It is elevating uh, Mary to a status that she does not actually, uh, wouldn't actually want or deserve. She was the vessel that God used. It, she was a wonderful person. I'm sure, it, I'm looking forward to meeting her, but she was not elevated to the point of Godship the way that the Catholic Church was made. She, uh, she obviously had uh, physical relations with her husband, Joseph, and they had children. They had, they had uh, 
they had male children, they had female children. Jesus had brothers. There were multiple brothers. They're mentioned in the Bible, the brothers uh, that Jesus has. In fact, two of them became important church leaders after Jesus died and, and ascended into heaven. In fact, in the book of Acts, it says that his brothers, um, his brothers were there with the disciples in the filling of the Holy Spirit when that all, when that all transpired and, and took place. But here's this point. They come to him and they say, look, your mother, your brothers are standing outside speaking, uh, seeking to speak with you. And Jesus responds in an odd way. And he responds this way. He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And Jesus is making an incredibly important statement that it's not about the physical birth. It is not about physically being born into a family. It is about the spiritual birth. And when you do the will of God in heaven, you become a part of his family and you become a part of Jesus's family. What is God's will in heaven? Well, John chapter, chapter 6, verse 40 indicates and tells us exactly what God's will is. This is the will of him who sent me, Jesus says, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. That's God's will. When you make the decision to say, Jesus, I believe in you, I'm willing to repent of my sins and turn toward you, even though I have, I have played the harlot, even though I have, I have done what is evil in your sight, I repent of that, I come to you, I ask Jesus for you to come into my life, please forgive me of my sins, I believe in you. When you do that, you automatically become a part of the family of God. Jesus looks at you and he holds out his hands and he says, you are my brother and my sister and my mother. You're part, you're, you're part of my family. That's what he's saying. You're not, you're not literally the mother, the brother, the sister. You're part of the family of God. Ephesians chapter 1 says that we have been adopted by God. Romans chapter 8 says that we have been adopted as his children by which we can now cry out, Abba, Father. That's the word that means daddy. How does that happen? Well, it happens when you, you repent of the sin, you ask for forgiveness, you believe in him, and you determine that you're going to follow him with the rest of your life. If you have not done that, I want to invite you right now to make that choice and to make that decision. I want to pray, and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I am sorry for what I have done. I am sorry for the ways that I have walked away from you in my life. Now, Jesus, I repent of those things. I turn away from them and I turn to you. And I ask you, Jesus, that you would please forgive me and forgive the sins that I have committed. Jesus, I want to be committed to you. I believe in you. And I am willing to commit my life to you. So, Jesus, please save me. And thank you for doing so. I pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. If you made that decision, if you made that decision to pray that prayer with me, you are now a part of the family of God, to which Jesus holds out his hands and says, Behold, he or she is my brother or sister. He or she is a part of my family. I want to congratulate you for doing that. And for making that choice, there is no more important choice that you can make with your life than you commit your life to him, that you believe in him. And if you do, you will have everlasting life. You are now a part of God's family. If you have not prayed that prayer, I would encourage you to think about it and make that decision because it is the most important decision. It's not a life decision. It's an eternal decision. Well, I hope you got something out of today. Please join me back here tomorrow as we dive into Matthew chapter 13. God bless you until tomorrow. You have a great day and a great evening.